Good morning, Edward. Good. Good afternoon. How are you doing? So far, so good. Uh, it's been kind of uh, now transitioning from winters to summers now. So the part of the country that uh, we are in, uh, it goes from extreme zero degree centigrade to uh, 50 degree centigrade. So Outstanding. It's easy to plan. <laughs> <laughs> You have been to India earlier as well, right? Oh, yeah. Lots of times. Lots of times. No. Oh, okay. and, and where all have you visited uh, in India? Um, so I stood up a 500-person operation in Gurgaon okay. in 2008. Um, I had been to Hyderabad, Pune, Chennai, to obviously Delhi, Gurgaon area, um, Chennai is where I stood up the 50 person RPA center of excellence that got me and, and my, my co-founder started back when we were at Sutherland. And that was, that was in 2012. Um, and, you know, and, and then Symphony had a team in, uh, in Bangalore um, in 2000, whatever, 15, 16. So yeah, so I've spent a lot of time in India um, been back and forth. My my first job out of uh, business school was actually with Infosys. Wow. Um, so I, I was at Infosys for about two years before I, I left and joined Capgemini. Interestingly, I never went to India with Infosys, but I went to India a whole lot with Capgemini and all the other outsourcing jobs I did. So, so yeah. Well, oh, that's very interesting. I'm like, uh, you uh, you actually started with Infosys, but came to India uh, largely when you were with Symphony and Sutherland, right? So, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah it was. Um, it's funny because I I met um, I met uh, Murti actually at the, during my business school years. I took a trip to India. It was a it was a, the India Tech Trek, where you went, and I'd never been to India before, so that was my first time in India. And I went, and you went with a whole bunch of alumni or a whole bunch of your classmates. Um, and I just, I happen to have a bunch of classmates from India and, and the school's really well connected in India. So we met all sorts of people. It was an amazing experience. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons that I, I ended up, um, starting my, my career after business school at Infosys. Infosys had started a consulting practice, a strategy consulting team. And so I was, I was one of the earlier members of that team. So. That's really nice. So I think, I think we'll have some very interesting chat today. So to all the participants who are joining in, guys, just stay tuned for uh, five more minutes and we were just doing a sound check. Uh, it looks like everything is fine. Uh, tech is behaving uh, as usual right now. So <laughs> we hope that- <laughs> Which it, is not usual, by the way. Yeah, this is not <laughs> usual. So we hope that it remains <laughs> this way. Uh, so thank you so much. And in case you guys have any questions, keep pouring in uh, all the queries that you have with regard to future of work. And uh, you, you've already seen what, uh, Ian has been uh, doing largely. We'll talk a lot more. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be fun. And uh, I guess uh, so. I've got a few questions already, uh, Ian, with me, and uh, we'll certainly touch base on all those pointers. Uh, Great. And, uh, you know, I think it, it would be fun. Uh, just curious, I'm like, how's your drive time going on? Uh, is it uh, is it continuing? How is it how is it going on right now? It, it, it is, it will continue. Um, I need to send out the next one today, actually. Um, the challenge with the audio live events, Kapil, is that it doesn't, uh, the LinkedIn algorithm doesn't, doesn't shout it out <laughs> very loudly. So it's kind of like, we're doing an audio event is what the algorithm does. So, so nobody hears about it unless you directly grab them and invite them into this thing. And so, um, so the turnout has been a little low. And the challenge, the bigger challenge is when I used to do live audio events, even if one person showed up, you had an audience, you did it, it was recorded, and then it was out there forever. So people could see it and, and listen to it later. The live audio events, not the same story. It doesn't get recorded. So it's, it only happens for the people who are in the event at that moment. And so it's kind of a balance of, is this the best use of our time or, or can we be doing something else? So, so I may... Um, <clears throat> I may convert the drive time live audio events to drive time live video events for that reason. So. Oh, okay. I think I think that would be fun. 
So because yeah. uh, it it looks like uh, you know LinkedIn is getting there. So maybe uh, pretty soon it would be more like Twitter Spaces, uh, which has matured enough uh, for quite some time. Uh, yep. Clubhouse is doing some uh, you know interesting stuff in India. A friend of mine is running Leher, and uh, okay. it's it's a, it's a it's more of video conversation, uh, which is beyond uh, just the audio conversations. And right. You you can build your community there and. Uh, it's really interesting. I, I I'm sure that you know conversations are going to be the future and uh, a much better version of a po- podcast wherein you know you can have interactive uh, uh, sessions, right? And, and that's exactly it. It really it, it's 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 harder to moderate certainly yeah. than just having like me and a guest and I ask the guest a bunch of questions and then then you type something in and I choose whether to read it or not. Um, it's you really do bring people on stage. So you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. The person could be great or could have no question at all. So it, so I like that challenge. Um, and you're right, the, that ability to, to really um, have a community come together is a hugely powerful capability. So, and, I, and, and it is the future. And plus we're all working at home and we're stuck and, and we miss each other. And, uh, and yet we don't need to get on airplanes and waste hours and hours to see each other. We can do this. This is very effective. No, absolutely. Uh, I guess we are just uh, about to get started. So, uh, guys who have uh, joined in and who are uh, watching us on LinkedIn Live, uh, we would be uh, starting maybe in the next couple of minutes. Uh, we're just doing some chit-chat before we get started. Um, and I'm sure that you guys will have fun with regard to, uh, you know, what, uh, what exactly and has been doing all through uh, some of the courses that he has done, he has put on LinkedIn, uh, it's been crazy. Um, I'm myself recommending to some people to kind of go and get those, uh, get enrolled for those courses, right? So- oh, cool. uh, because, thank you very much. Oh, oh I, I, I think it's it's wisdom and uh, so kind of you that, you know, you have been sharing that with people uh, uh, with whatever learning that you've had in the last so many years. Uh, and uh, I think some, some great polls that you've been running uh, will be, kind of you know trying to touch uh, upon those as well so okay <laughs> so i think it's uh, 6 30 uh, our time and eight o'clock your time uh, so ian welcome to coffee chat with five fairs uh, thank you i think uh, first of all you know thank you for agreeing to do this uh, so early uh, your morning you have my coffee all right <laughs> Nice. so, uh, so uh, you know uh, first of all eight o'clock too early a time for you uh, really appreciate that you're making time for this. Coffee Chat with Five has actually started uh, to, you know, uh, with the concept of having meaningful conversations. So I kind of do it every month. Uh, and one of the most favorite topics that I uh, usually try and touch base in every conversation that I have is on impact sourcing. Uh, and I think uh, it, it was a phenomenal conversation that you had with uh, Rita the other day from Everest. Uh, and I'm sure that people uh, would have learned a lot from, uh, you know, what you guys spoke uh, the other day. It was, uh, it's been a passion of mine for a long time. Mm -hmm. The challenge I had, and we'll probably get into this, but when I I started a a consultancy seven years ago now, um, and I wanted to incorporate impact sourcing into our model a great deal more. What got in the way was just sort of the prevailing winds of fascination with RPA. So we ended up just becoming just an RPA shop. Um, but I had actually I had actually stumbled on impact sourcing through um, an industry organization, the, uh, the IAOP, International Association of Outsourcing Professionals. Um, I was there for a conference presenting my own stuff and had met uh, the work that the Rockefeller Foundation and, and Everest had contributed with research and some other real dedicated, passionate individuals were doing. And it's just, it's just a great story all around, right? I mean, just using work to create prosperity and impact on those who had the capability, just didn't quite have the access to the ability to do that work. I mean, it, so it's been a passion ever since. Um, and I hope to get a lot more involved in it in useful ways in the, uh, in the future. No, absolutely. I think uh, I have myself witnessed uh best RPA developers coming in from non-technology background and, uh, you know, somebody who had actually left the education and then, you know, picked up RPA and currently 
building humongous applications. So anyways, let's get started. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself uh, for uh, the people who do not know the side of Ian uh, in terms of the exciting journey that you've had uh, over the last so many years? Tell them, I've got to hire you as PR because you're doing such a good, you're, you're being so nice to me. I don't know if I'm anywhere near this exciting, but I'll, let's see. Um, so who am I? Uh, I... I spent the first 10 years of my career in, in consulting, was doing a lot of sort of IT implementation and strategy stuff because I thought it was cool, but I wanted to travel. That was my probably my only goal is I wanted to travel the world and see cool places. And I didn't do very much of that in consulting. I ended up in New Jersey a whole lot. Um, and so, so then after business school, uh, as you and I were just chatting, after business school, I was exposed to some of the amazing um, enterprises and the real exciting growth, sort of explosive growth that was going on in India at the time. And so, uh, and had taken a trip to India while in business school, which was very cool. Was first time I'd ever been. And so right out of school, I joined Infosys. And Infosys had just started a, uh, a consult, a strategy consulting program uh, or operation. So I, I joined that for a few years. And then after that, I, I jumped into outsourcing just both feet in, jumped into outsourcing, went to a company called Capgemini and, and spent a few years there learning outsourcing from the ground up. Because I, I remember I was just a consulting guy, um, but I got to be a solution architect and got to go to all the different site visits and then was lucky enough to win a very large deal um, that happens to have five delivery locations. One of them was in Gurgaon. And so um, I stood up a team there, got to spend a bunch of time with them, learned about how to actually build a team, how to actually create something more than just simply PowerPoint slides, because I was, I was really good at PowerPoint slides, but that was all I'd ever built, really. So, um, so I did that uh, and then went on a journey through outsourcing, um, left cap, went to a few other outsourcing companies, always fascinated with innovation, always looking at how can new things did not have to be technology necessarily, but new best practices, new approaches, new philosophies, and new technology could contribute to the evolution of our craft. And so uh, I stumbled on robotic process automation and I was just lucky. I was in the right place at the right time, found an opportunity to, to tinker and test with RPA. Um, this was at, the, I was at Sutherland Global Services at the time. And, um, and the rest is history, uh, effectively, because I, 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 I did it at Sutherland. We developed a strong capability there. And then I and a few of my, my longtime business colleagues and friends left and started a company called Symphony Ventures. And Symphony uh, was, to my knowledge, we were the third RPA pure play um, there were two others before us who were friends of ours, and and uh, and we grew that for the last several, for from 2014 to 2018, we grew that uh, to the largest RPA peer play uh, uh, around. It was about 225 people large. Um, had an operation in India, had an operation in Mexico and in Poland, as well as the UK and the US, uh, and then I sold it. And so we sold Symphony to a call center company called Sykes that no longer exists because it was sold itself to Cytel, another call center company. Um, and I've been basically wandering around aimlessly and free for the last nine or so months, uh, putting out stuff on LinkedIn, as you say, educating, just educating myself probably more than anything else, just trying to learn what else is new and exciting and what's going on. So that was me. Sorry, that was a long summary. I'm going to sip some coffee. Now. I guess, I guess it's going to be more interesting if we kind of, you know, delve a bit deeper. Uh, you are actually talking about RPA when, uh, you know, people actually uh, did not believe that something like this would come up uh, and become so big. And in fact, even today, there are, uh, you know, uh, some elements of doubts in people's minds. I'm, I, I was, I'm actually referring to a poll that even I did about a couple of weeks back. And I said, you know, how many of you are not sure of uh, implementing RPA? There were quite a few people who felt that we are, staying, we are still figuring out where do we really want to, you know, kind of leverage RPA because there is always that belief that, you know, it's going to take 
jobs away whether we really want to do it we don't really want to do it so how the journey has been for you in terms of you know uh, bringing an rpa from whatever you are you were doing to you know where it stands today and what according to you is going to be the future uh, you know in in a brief uh, view yep. so just quick this coffee chat is 5 hours long right so i have enough time to answer this question um it's it is fascinating to me I, I love this. Um, I love this journey. I love having had a front row seat to the, you know, the, the, the Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm, early adopter, mid, later adopter sort of um, event. Because yes, in the very beginning, and I wasn't there at the beginning, right? Um, there were many others who were there for a lot longer than I was. Um, the RPA, the, the big three, Automation Anywhere, Blue Prism, UiPath, all had been around for 10 years or so before, before all of a sudden there was this new exciting name to the space and people started to get um, interested in it. Um, it was macros on steroids back then. And I don't think that's a bad, bad word or a, a, a sort of a pejorative. I think that was actually really helpful to, to say like, okay, I, I know what macros are. And steroids make things bigger and stronger, apparently. So, um, and so bigger, stronger macros. Okay. Um, some people saw the art of the possible. Some people saw it as challenging, sort of more sort of foundational capabilities. Like we should just build this into the system, or we should have APIs, or like the whole the whole process should be transformed instead of doing lipstick on pig stuff with RPA that just you know, that, that paves cow paths, right? That replaces the, the more manual way you're doing things. Problem is business is messy and ever changing. And so to have this tool in your toolkit is pretty darn powerful. Um, I don't think anybody who knew what they were talking about ever said RPA was the absolute answer to anything. It was just, it was a component to a solution set. Yeah. Um, one of the greatest revelations a CIO of a, like a $10 billion company had uh, said to me one time is she, she realized RPA effectively allows you to prototype the future state. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Our processes are junky, our systems are disconnected, the experience is bad, but if we use RPA, we can kind of glue this stuff together and say, oh, well, that looks much better. That's what we should be ultimately trying to build to in the future. But for now, we've got something that's working and then you know we'll replace it over time. And whether you do or not is, is a different story, but, but it gave us another building block to experiment like that. So I, I guess I'll, I'll leave with, I think RPA is powerful for a few reasons. Um, one, because it is a technology set that's, a, that's easier to understand and deploy than like Python, right? So, so not necessarily every business analyst can, can rapidly pick this stuff up and use it, but it's not impossible. Lots of people our, our sort of ideal hire at Symphony wasn't a coder. We wanted somebody who had logical thinking and structure. It was usually physics or math majors, um, but didn't want to code. And so this tool set worked well for their problem solving um, mindset. So it's, it's powerful for that reason. Um, it is... It is helping enterprises learn about the art of the possible for deploying technology. It is, you know, some say it's a gateway drug to artificial intelligence. You know, it's just, you get a taste of and a feel for what automation can do. And then you add other cognitive capabilities and it's that, it is that, I think that's yeah. that. Um, but I'll final, I'll finish with this. I think the most powerful thing RPA has done for industry bar none, hands down. The most powerful thing is it's given many, many, many more people a lens through which to look at their own work and their enterprises work and functioning to ask themselves, is this as good as we can be doing? Is this as good as it gets? 
And so that lens of potential and opportunity, I think, has kicked off just a just a, a blossoming of of innovative thought um, in every every layer of every enterprise across the world. Whether you even use RPA or not, the fact that all of a sudden you became aware that it existed and a bit attuned to what it can do for you, right. so that you started to look at your world a little differently. That's enough for me. I think it was, I think it's a success for that reason. Well, yeah, absolutely. I think one of the most important thing that you actually touched upon, which was the first point that you talked about, was largely uh, the fact that it is one, easier to understand and deploy, which means it can actually get a skill uh, without having too much of skill. Right. Yeah. So uh, it, it is something wherein, you know, uh, while obviously, you know, the end game could be. Uh, automation through one or other way. Obviously, we are talking about AI and machine learning capabilities, but obviously it can become that gateway. But the biggest problem right now is that not many organizations have got those skill sets. So certainly even today, if you talk about very basic tasks, mundane uh, tasks, even the platforms leveraging capabilities from uh, you know things like RPA, where you are talking about uh, using various use cases, which obviously you know we will talk about, uh, it has certainly got that scale and uh, solves problem where, you know, obviously businesses do not have that much time wherein whether they decide to invest into technology and research to kind of build a model which is just right suiting to, you know, what they would want to ideally build in case of AI, machine learning, Python is no joke. And uh, the mortality rate so far has been very, very high, right? So I think certainly it's a, it's a big use case. Taking me to the next point of discussion, uh, you have done lots and lots of programs and one of the signature program is your program on LinkedIn wherein you have, you have put in a course all together for people who want to learn and understand RPA. So why don't you really you know, give, a, give a brief on that and then obviously I would request my team to kind of put that, co uh, that course's link on our chat so that people can actually get benefited from it. No, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, this is a, it's somewhat of a funny story, I guess. Um, which is I started to use video as a means of branding and communication for my tiny little startup, right? We didn't have a huge marketing team. We did not have a huge marketing budget. Um, we had, we had a few people, me and, and a few others who were willing to get out there and just embarrass themselves by, you know, putting their phone up in front of their face and just start talking. And hopefully it wasn't terrible. And and so we started to do that, started to put some videos on LinkedIn. Um, and I'd long been a, a, a student of LinkedIn learning. Um, I used to, but I was taking classes like how to become good at photography, because there were some great photography classes at the time. Um, and, uh, and then I was at a conference. I was at an, uh, a shared services and outsourcing conference. And I'm hanging out at, actually, it was NICE, NICE's RPA um, group. I was hanging out at NICE's booth, just saying hi to my friends there. And this woman comes by who's a content producer for LinkedIn Learning. And she was just looking for new material. And it was like the greatest thing ever. I was so excited. I was so excited to meet her. I was showing her videos I was doing on my phone and, and I knew LinkedIn Learning. So I'm like, I can do this. I can, please, let me, please let me be the guy who talks about RPA. And she was foolish enough to let me be the guy who talks about RPA on LinkedIn Learning. Uh, and so fast forward to, I wrote a course that was basically everything that I'd been saying and had wanted to say to help people who were not familiar with RPA know what it was, but just as much know what it was not right? It's not magic. It's not easy. You do need a plan. You need communication and everything, but also these are the technical components of it. And so we, we put that course together and um, uh, went and filmed it at a studio that LinkedIn has, which is like the coolest thing in the world to be in like recording booths and film studios with all sorts of green screens and stuff. Um, and uh, I would do that all day long if I had, <laughs> if I had more things. And actually I, so I did that one. Um, I did a second course, um, which was actually going to be my first course. The, the working title of it was an MBA in RPA. 
Wow. It ended up with a it ended up with a much longer and much worse title, but um, it was RPA AI and Cognitive Tech for Leaders. Um, but the idea was that leadership, middle management and above, needed to understand this this ca- capability too, because none of this works unless you have strong leadership vision and a top down mandate. Yeah. that comes with budget and air cover and success metrics cuz a lot of people a lot of people in the trenches right like at work at the front feel they can do cool things and start to tinker and do cool things and RPA lets that happen too but it never that never set them up for scale if right. it was just appeal solving a problem at his desk with a process he knows well you're never going to have tens, hundreds of bots doing that same thing because because you didn't get the approval of IT because you didn't have the but anyway. So that was the second course was was getting management involved. Um, and it's cool because like 200,000 or so people have taken these courses. Mm-hmm. 200,000 people? Yeah. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's, it's and, and, and the most exciting thing for me is... Um, is just seeing who they are and where they are. Um, like I don't, I don't get to see everybody that just because of data security. I don't know everyone who's taken it. But if anybody has taken the course and then likes it or shares their certification of completion, um, then I know who they are, and because it's attached to your LinkedIn profile. Nice. And it's just so energizing to see companies around the world investing in their people, yeah, and people investing in themselves. And uh, anyway, I'll leave it at that. But it was, it was there. I had a lot of fun doing them. Hopefully they're useful to people. And I'm actually doing more of them. I just finished recording one on intelligent automation. Wow. Um, and I'm writing one right now, writing, uh, well, writing two to three, really, I'm working on. And so hopefully those come out by the middle of the year as well. So I'll, I'll share those with you when they're done. So, oh, yeah. awesome. I think I think this is just amazing. I'm like, uh, it looks like it's just getting started, right? And uh, that there is more in that Pandora box. When it opens, I will get to know. I guess <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I it's so much fun to 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 teach and to feel like you're part of other people's journey, yeah. and that you can help in some way because this really is exciting and it really is creating a potential for for great impact and great career progression for people. And no, so- absolutely. Even from a technology standpoint, what do you think? So there have been a lot of talks uh, with regard to uh, RPA, IPA, uh, yeah. in terms of you know what digital transformation or intelligent automation, how people call it, uh, yeah. you know, going to be the future. Some say that if you're starting now, you are late to the party. Some say that you know uh, it's never too late. Uh, what do you think it's going to stay? One word. Um, so, I mean, I don't think too late is irrelevant because if you don't start, then you may as well just close up shop and, and just go away. Just figure out what you're worth and sell your company because, but everybody needs to be, again, everybody needs to be looking at their own operation through a lens of modern tools available to them right Right. whether it's whether it's rpa or anything else and the challenge with the space is that we just keep coming up with new names for things Mm -hmm. so it makes it very hard to feel like you're on top of the new trend um but you know software is evolving it's getting better algorithms are getting more accurate um processing power is, is getting cheaper and so automations of various sorts will find themselves in, in the work we do today and in the building block of, of components we use to design the work we will do tomorrow. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I've seen big companies have some incredible initiatives and some small companies be be a little antiquated. So I don't, I don't, I think everyone has a chance to play and compete in this space. Uh, more importantly, you just need to make sure that your teams, every level, anybody, you know, the, the, the most experienced senior person in the team to the newest greenest one, 
at least has a digital quotient, has a has a has a knowledge set that makes them aware of of what's happening and what's possible, so that that finds itself in every discussion you have. So. Indeed, because I think uh, you, you've already built a business on this, you have sold it, and you know obviously it is it is still continuing as a great practice, and we have also experienced uh, some very interesting patterns. Uh, with our journey as well. Talking about a question, uh, which I think we would just kind of insert within uh, our next flow is basically, uh, you know, somebody is wanting to know that, you know, when you work in BPOs, uh, the major focus is on key performance indicators. The clients actually look at, you know, insights, business intelligence, all of that, right? So how do you think businesses can possibly help uh, or rather technology can help uh, the BPOs or for that matter, any business that's kind of providing services to the principal uh, leverage digital transformation and be more, uh, you know, efficient in that. Linking it to maybe a case study, say, for example, something in the area of customer experience that can possibly help people correlate. Yeah, BPOs are such an interesting animal. Uh, and again, having spent the last 12, 15 years of my life in that space. Um, because BPOs have such an intense capability to be absolute game changers in this space. Right? It's, it is a bunch of dedicated professionals whose purpose is to be transacting a specific function, right? Whether it be handling customer inquiries and, and or a technical um, problem solving or, or sales or whatever it is, and that's front office or back office, any of the functional HR, or finance and accounting, supply chain, logistics processes. Right? You've got teams of experts, and then you've got teams of experts on the top of the experts who are looking at the analytics and the insight and doing the Six Sigma and Kaizen lean stuff. Um, and so it could be so powerful for them. Um, the challenge I found was the relationship and the contract between the buyer and the, the provider. And so much as traditional PPO relationships didn't allow innovation to really happen very well. And so ultimately you found the BPOs themselves doing innovation internally, but having to almost do it quietly, having to do it um, under, under covers. And, uh, and that has to stop. That component of the BPO industry is full on broken, totally antiquated, and absolutely a, a barrier to true innovation. Mm -hmm. Because to the point in the question around KPIs, any sort of metrics at all, any sort of access to data, any sort of ability to, to, to glean insight from the processes, you need to be collaborating. Mm -hmm. Because I had, you know, Unfortunately, some of the case studies I have are clients that just didn't let our teams see any of the data, right? They gave us enough data to be able to staff a team, and that was about it. And that's got to stop because that's just, that's just broken, antiquated thinking that will ensure that that team is only as good as that team can be by themselves without mm -hmm. any sort of clever. So. Anyway, so a BPO needs to be ripped down to its studs and rebuilt up as a collaborative affair um, with, with relationships that enable co-development, co-innovation, co-design, co-co-co, um, because otherwise it's, it just it isn't going to fulfill the art of the possible. Um, but yes, I mean, as, as far as in, in front office, I have seen the earliest developments of um, cobots and, and augmentation technologies that help agents to you know, anticipate the systems and the data that they need to access to speed up calls a little bit, um, shorten average handle times. I've seen, um, I've seen sort of next best action capabilities that say, this is what you should say next, or this is what you should try to sell them next, because this royal road suggests that like they'll buy a new thing if you say the following. Um, so those I think are, are somewhat compelling. The ones I really want to see are, are geared towards proactivity. I'd love to see more technologies focusing on the telematics of any customer journey, mm -hmm. where it just straight up says, I don't know, like 
Ian's credit card was just hacked and he just canceled it, call him immediately and offer him all of the sensible next step things he's going to call you and ask for anyway. We know this. We've got all the data models. Um, but be proactive and support him. And you've got the people and the bandwidth to do it just because the automation that's doing the mundane stuff has taken some of the, that work off their hands. So you can use the people to be really good at what they are, which is human. Yeah. Um, and so those are the exercises that enterprises need to put themselves through is if all of my humans could be just human and we had all of our data available to us and it was clean and reliable and it doesn't matter that we have a shit ton of systems that aren't integrated together because of all of our, you know, acquisitions and mergers and everything else. Um, what, what could we do? And I think that would be really energizing to a lot of people. And, and this is to refer back to a, a statement you made in a question two ago, but the sort of the fate of humanity in this whole world of automation. I've been listening to the whole robots take our jobs garbage for 10 years now. And enough confident enough or dumb enough to just declare it's not going to happen. Robots yeah. will robots will not take all the jobs. They will take some components of our jobs, often the components we don't like. And as long as we make a commitment to ourselves to stay on top of trends and, and basic skills, right. there will there will be opportunities for us because technology always creates opportunity while it solves for friction and inefficiency. And so um, I think the future of work is a very exciting place um, as long as you're not, you know, fighting the robot and, and saying, I, I really do enjoy data entry and I want that to stay, damn you robot. Um, as long as you're not that person, right. um, the future is very bright for us. And so that's why impact sourcing and things like that are so incredibly exciting to me because yeah. there's so much potential there. There's yeah. so much talent and capability. Um, and it will absolutely be a valuable component of the future of work. No, indeed. I think, uh, I think that's something which is very interesting. And I was, while you were talking about it, I was actually thinking about a use case that we had. And, uh, you know, we were actually thinking about, okay, this is where you can actually leverage technology, wherein, for example, if you've got integrated systems, you've got data coming to you. For ex and let's take the same example of the credit card. You know that the credit card has been delivered to Ian or Kapil for that matter. And what is that Ian would want to do next, right? Uh, again, leveraging technology and saying that, hey, you know what? If you have any problem, uh, so, you know, looking into this or to know the next steps, we are just a call away and here we are, right? So I think these yeah. are some use cases when you can actually uh, build an integrated system because there are so many systems that we are talking about at this point of time. And to get everything into a single funnel, it certainly yeah. is not going to be easy. And that's where technology and, uh, can be leveraged uh, and people can be leveraged to complement the technology and the data that you get to still uh, make it work in the best possible way. I think totally. this, is, this is really amazing. And uh, as you rightly mentioned, I'm like impact sourcing, uh, there have been uh, some real amazing examples. Uh, there are, mm -hmm. There's a lady who is doing some program in Afghanistan, Syria, uh, leveraging people uh, who were affected due to war and, uh, you know, making them, uh, you know, being, being a good uh, earning member for the family and the community. And I think these are the ways to kind of educate people, bring them up the curve with regard to skills. And that's the real future of work while creating positive impact amongst the communities. Right. Totally. Oh, and I think that's one of the things I found interesting about BPO about my outsourcing career was, was how important it was to open people's eyes to, to, to people around the world, right? It, and because, you know, just naturally, I think we're, we're tribal as, as an animal, us humans. And so um, we stick to our little tribes in some cases. And so some of the clients that I used to take on, on site visits it would take a bit, but then they'd realize like, holy moly, this team here that's, you know, lives in a different place and, and has some different, um, you know, traditions or whatever. Um, 
is hugely capable and also great people and could be friends and we have fun. Maybe their food is way too spicy for my head to survive a dinner. But other than that, it's great fun. Um, and it's in impact sourcing is the same way. It's just, there's just so much talent out there. It just, the thing that we lack is not, not an ability in, in people like that woman in Afghanistan. The thing that we lack is just the the connectivity is the ability to get to her and and give her an opportunity but once once we do and once we have given her the opportunity and we're going to be we're going to be i mean it'll be amazing um and so i mean good for you for doing those sorts of things i'd love to to work with you to highlight stories like that just because not only is it energizing but it's 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 proof positive that technology helps spread prosperity yeah. and um and give agency and the, give people that sense of of um sort of independence and capability that's so powerful great so uh let's move on and maybe i'll take yeah. a, a question that we've got uh, the question is what can be the best or ideal way or rather the structure to find out transformation opportunity in any program or process how do you go about identifying uh, that, you know, there is a possibility? <laughs> I used to always say, find the person in the, in the operations team who just seems like they were always complaining. Um, <laughs> find the really grumpy person because generally people who are complaining were the ones who saw all the problems in the, <laughs> in the process you had. And then as long as you listened to them with the open mind of like, okay, these are opportunities, not problems. Um, then you found all sorts of opportunities. Um, but interestingly, the way to do it is to create whatever you call them, vision workshops, design thinking sessions. We create this sort of safe space where people come in and step away from what they're, what they're doing day to day. And they re-examine everything that they have done. Again, that's why I think the lens of automation is so powerful because it's it has a lot less to do with just the robots and their capabilities and a lot more to do with just, huh, why do we do it that way kind of thing, right? And so <clears throat> I had this one funny example where we were working with a healthcare organization, a very large healthcare organization, and we were doing this vision workshop with them. And the, the whole structure of the vision workshop was education first, so that like, this is what these tools are. Like RPA looks like this. Here's a really cute little example of it, moving data and doing stuff so that you became aware, you knew that was a tool. And then we would walk through some brainstorming exercises of where might this be applicable. In the course of that day, they, they had someone step out of that room two different times, two times because they realized that there were processes they were currently doing that the last initiative, transformation technology initiative was put in place so that those steps were no longer necessary. They were still doing them like years later, they were still doing these like validation checks or whatever authorizations or something. And they realized through this brainstorm, like, holy cow, what are we still doing that? Okay, someone go tell you know Janet to stop it. And so they go out and they get on the phone. And so, so what was fascinating to me is, you know, these were smart people and they were good at their job. They were just, you become very focused on, on the current state reality. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so every transformation journey begins with an opening of your aperture and, and an opening of your mind to take a how you do, do it. And if you need to do it. And what the, I mean, ultimately the sort of what's the, what's the final outcome we, is, is the purpose of this process to move numbers across four different applications, or is the purpose of this process to make a customer happy that a problem was solved? And then you work backwards from there. Cool. I think, I think this is, this is, um, this is as simple as it can get. And it looks like, you know, people are going to go back and possibly try and do some brainstorming session. Uh, guys, if you do it, just let us know uh, if, it, if it actually benefits you. I mean, if say it that blows up and someone gets injured, <laughs> we, have, we have no legal responsibility for that. Uh, no, and, and it's, 
<laughs> you know, I could spin, I could spin up a, a much more complex model or methodology. Everyone has one. It's right, like working backwards or the vision workshop thingy or the design thinking structure or whatever, you know, find one that works for you and your culture and your, and your, your team. Um, but the more important thing is, is that open mind approach, right? Absolutely. Don't go in just say, well, we've got to do it that way because it's always been done that way. Because the fact is, that's just not true because it hasn't always been done. Yeah. <laughs> right. Those, like, if you can show me that since the beginning of time, you've been transacting, you know, you know, employee onboarding <laughs> that way, then, then you're right. It's always been done that way. But, but it's always been done that way since you bought that other company and you combined your two systems and then someone made a mistake one time. So you had to add a human like QA check and then so blah, blah, blah. Right. So all of it is, is open to being questioned and challenged and ultimately transformed. Right. I think, I think this is really cool. Uh, so moving on to the next one, there's a, there's a myth which says that, you know, uh, uh, people need to be technologically uh, equipped to be able to build or leverage RPA. Uh, what do you think how people can be more skilled to uh, be, you know, say, for example, uh, leveraging or building RPA bots to uh, solve simple problems or rather for that matter, complex problems? Yeah, this is, this is another fascinating trend, this concept of the citizen developer, where that every citizen in an enterprise who's not IT. So citizen to me means not IT. Um, so the non-technical people can be building bots. I don't think all non-technical people should build bots. Right? But I do think there is a spectrum of people in an organization who all contribute to the identification of opportunities to the design of the, the new solution, to the outlining and architecting of that technical solution. And then some of the people should know enough about the technology to prototype it. Um, you should propose it to IT and say, this is what the business team is thinking. And IT should say, yes, that, that passes our tests. That's okay. You've documented it correctly. Your change control measures are, are in place and respectful of IT's. Um, sort of documentation requirements. And, um, and then if it gets bigger than or more complex, then you've got a partner in IT to, to continue to scale it. Um, because what RPA allows you to do is effectively action or actualize every innovation competition a company has ever held. Mm -hmm. Right. All of those, all of those suggestion boxes and innovation days where people say it would be really cool if I didn't have to log in eight times a day into this one system, or it would be so neat if I didn't have to copy and paste and scrape whenever. Now, rather than writing it down on a card and slipping it in a box, you can say, this is how I envision the better state to be. And I worked with, you know, I worked with these three other individuals on the team who each fit those different characteristics of able to identify the part that stinks, right? Mm -hmm. the, the one who complains a lot, able to draw it up on a whiteboard, the one who thinks visually, able yeah. to tie it to all the existing old systems, sort of that process expert who's been around for a long time. And then able to tie it to the tools we have available in the corporate toolkit to more the sort of the, the techie sort of citizen developer person. Um, you know, that, that group can come together and make it happen. And so not everyone should feel like they've got to go pick up UI path or something else and learn it tomorrow. Cause I just, it won't happen that way. Mm -hmm. So to expect it to happen that way, only leave certain people feeling like they've failed to get on this train of the future of work when there are lots of different seats and a lot of different roles to play on, on this journey. No, awesome. I think, I think that's the way to go about things. And obviously you need to be very, very clear in your head that you are going for it. And mm -hmm. obviously there is no way that you can be left out. And you mentioned it earlier during the chat as well, that you better shut jobs and then move on because that's not a way to kind of, you know, look at the future of work. Things are changing. People do want, uh, you know, some certainty, but obviously they are looking at experimentations that can make 
lives much yeah. more easier. So uh, that takes me to the next one, uh, you know, before we kind of, you know, take uh, one more audience question and, uh, you know, it's like it's already 45 minutes we've been talking. So <laughs> uh, we can That's go great. on and on. <laughs> on and on. Like I said, we need five hours just to keep answering that first question. So yeah. no, I've absolutely. cleared my schedule. <laughs> so uh, the point here is how can this transformation uh, possibly be much more useful uh, in a B2C use case? Uh, how can it solve problem uh, from a you know, consumer perspective and any, any company which is into the B2C space uh, can leverage uh, the power of RPA or for that matter, cognitive uh, automation. Yes. So again, back to the constraints of traditional enterprise almost prevent real problem solving as it relates to the customer. And this, the lens of the digital art of the possible has to break through that, that sense of, of, of just sort of, you know, of, of concreteness of the way things are currently done. Because from my experience, having worked with lots of large banks and healthcare companies and everything else, if the purpose is happy, happy employees, happy customers, happy prospective customers that then become the customers, right? Experience. If the purpose is good experience, then, then nothing about your existing policies, procedures, uh, systems, interfaces, batch schedules, whatever else should stand in the way of challenging the way you do things currently to make that customer experience better. Right. And what I've seen is, you know, things like, well, we can't report on data like that just because the operational systems aren't set up that way or the organizational like functions are such that we need to be tracking stuff this way and that way. Not because it's the way the customer buys. It's just the way the company's organized. Well, that garbage has to be completely blown up. And so that's where you got to start is just having the willingness to be to 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 break things down to then build them back up because the number of times that i've again it's back to like we've always done it that way we can't do it that way right this is special and different and so it can't apply to us and this is me also sort of sharing sort of this is like a therapy session from my BPO days too, of just like, ah, we're special, we're different. You can't do that to our processes and systems and whatever else. But the answer is sure you can, like nothing's special and different. Nothing's been done that way forever. Um, so you absolutely have to tear it down and start with that very simple principle of what is it you're actually trying to do. You know, and the cold hard reality is you're trying to make more money for the business. Absolutely. And the way to make more money for the business is to not piss off the people who are currently paying you money and to convince other people to pay you new money. And then, hey, and then all good. And, and you'd like to not piss off your own employees because they know stuff and the stuff they know is valuable. And it costs a lot of money to train a new person to know the same stuff. Right. So, you know, so internal frictions and, and costs for, um, getting someone else up to speed. So you know, ultimately, it's a, it's a very wise business decision to be comfortable challenging all of your current state realities to create a better end state. Um, so I forget even if I have answered the question, but those are those are some random <laughs> um, thinkings about about that. So yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think once you uh, put yourself in your customer's shoes, and then if you start thinking backward, you would know yep. uh, what is required, what is not required. Uh, and in fact, you also have internal customers in terms of people who are managing the front line, right? If yes. or to, to what extent you can make their lives easier. You also mentioned about, you know, hey, it looks like this customer journey is going to a level where you might want to talk to the customer about this. This is what you can possibly talk next. These are all enablers and certainly not, uh, you know, anything which is taking away jobs, but it is only going to contribute to better and I think consistent experiences that uh, customers would build. 
And that's a great one. It, it's being surprised is not something customers, uh, they don't, they don't call you to be surprised. This isn't their birthday. They don't want to be um, shocked about the way something happens or what they can't do. Um, and again, from a customer, the other thing I find fascinating about the customer experience side of things is we, we, we treat our customers as guinea pigs a lot, right? We test a whole bunch of stuff on them. Um, and we don't seem to, to, to care that it's annoying, right? Like chatbots just in general or voice recognition is kind of terrible still in a lot of cases. Uh, I mean, it, I, 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 unless, you're, unless your inquiry is very straightforward and very simple, the, the mantra of it's not if a chat bottle fail, it's just when the chat bottle fail and when it needs to hand over to a person is true. It, and, and it has been for years. And at least it is every time I, I give it a shot. So, um, so we've got to find a way to innovate with, with our customers, but not leave them feeling like they've just been subjected to a, a guinea pig test where they're unhappy, their problem's not solved. And then they get back on a phone with a human who starts right from the beginning and asks them what their name is <laughs> after having gone through. Um, Cause that's, that's a terrible experience. Absolutely. And I, I think, I think customers have put up with that for too long. Um, so we've got to find a way to, to, to innovate without, without innovate, without aggravating, innovate without aggravate. I'm going to write that down. Um, but <laughs> um, so, but, but there's so much energy dedicated to the customer experience, front office, B to C angle of, of services right now. It's bound to make a better experience. It's bound to like, things are happening. It's an exciting space out there. Um, and, and one that I was lucky enough to, to play some part in. So, no, I think uh, that's that's really amazing. Even in terms of future, uh, I was actually talking to a very good friend of mine who I think apparently is also uh, on this coffee chat uh, listening to us. Uh, wherein uh, there was a, there are lots and lots of models that are being talked about, and uh, in this particular case, we're talking about you know people being. Uh, too finicky about you know investing so much into bots, getting subscriptions and all of that. We really don't know where it would uh, you know end up. Then uh, you know this friend of mine he said that hey you know what I've got RPA as a service right you don't buy anything you don't own anything but you just pay for the value that you get or the outcome that you get. Uh, mm -hmm. Any views on the kind of models that you envisage in future that people uh, would resort to or the organizations might resort to? Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, back to that co, co, co comment collaborative, I think will create better outcomes. I think the biggest challenge of the RPA space was, was this idea that it's really easy. You should buy bots from me right now. We can get your people trained up instantly. If you'll find your processes quickly and you'll, and you'll succeed because that just did not work at scale. It just didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the co-component of, of we'll do this a bit more together, um, you'll, you'll feel the benefits, but I'm compelled to create benefits for you because that's how I get paid. Um, that could be a good model as long as the buyer doesn't see it as a way to just get free stuff for now and forever, right? The, the, the buyer has to realize that there's, there's two sides to this equation, you need to build good outcome models that do end up being monetizable for the, the supplier. Otherwise, you're just, you think you're taking advantage of, of some small startup to give you free stuff and they'll, they'll make it up somewhere else. And then you've just put your partner out of business. Um, and that's, you know, that's scars of being a small service provider speaking, but, you know, um, if you don't see it as collaborative, then you're not going to have long-term value from these things. Uh, but that said, too, co co bots generally means you're not customizing, so yeah. you need to be comfortable with a much more vanilla reality in your enterprise, so that you're buying um, you're you're buying modules that 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 provider can scale and sell to other people as well. If you're okay with that, then you know the sky's the limit. Then, then there's a potentially a lot of opportunity. Um, I guess in the back office space, I just struggle because I never saw 
an HR onboarding process that was exactly the same as the last one I saw, which is the same as the one before that, right? I never saw an accounts payable process that was virtually carbon copy of, of another one and a different client. Every client has different systems, different architectures, different policies, different internal decisions and behaviors. And so um, your as a service RPA has to be pretty discreet has to be pretty simple and focused on one little pocket in that in that spectrum. Otherwise, you need to customize it anyway. And if you're customizing it, then you know it's more expensive, and and you need a a, a more robust relationship with your with your provider. So, right. I think I think that's really amazing uh, and really good to know. Uh, to one of the uh, viewers. Uh, are digital transformation certification programs helpful for gaining digital leadership skills? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, pretty much. I'm like, uh, if you're a beginner, anything that you learn is only going to add. Uh, yeah. You're not going to lose anything, right? So, uh, I think I think that's a that's obviously a, a recommendation you should go for because at the end of the day, it's it's about learning. Uh, and Ian, I think I'm pretty amazed with uh, how you are learning and you've been learning all through and the way you are contributing to people's life by enabling them to learn with your courses. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, Ankit and his team uh, who are actually uh, managing the show uh, backstage, they are going to kind of make sure that, you know, some of the people really get benefited. And uh, the most important point that you mentioned uh, that I would like to again repeat and highlight is the fact that it has to be driven top down, the managers have to understand the importance first before even think about people doing it. So I think that's 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 real amazing. So uh, and we are we are almost towards the end of the coffee chat to understand from you uh, what do you think uh, 2025 or 2030 would look like in this digital transformation journey. Or is it very hazy, uh, so to say? Uh, if I knew the answer to that, man. Um, 20, 20, so I think, I'll give my clock speed analogy here. I think there are three clock speeds in business. There's the marketing and narrative clock speed, which is going just... just Marketing changes the names for things. We've got new like hype, new buzz, new new concepts like with every hour, which makes you always feel like you are you're ignorant and you don't know enough and you're lost and you've got to go do so. That's marketing. Um, technology is evolving somewhat quickly, but you know, but not lightning speed. So that's the second clock speed, which is you know, like I said, the RPA vendors had been around for ten years before I stumbled on them. And that was in 2012 um, and they've evolved since, but the tools are, you know, the tools, um, the AI tools we're all so excited about that stuff has been evolving for the last 60 years, right? Voice recognition, character recognition, all those things. They all, they all go back to the 1960s and seventies. So um, getting better and better, but they didn't show up last week and, and rock it onto the scene. And then there's the third and very slowest clock speed, which is enterprise ability to change. And I would always joke that you can't convince me that this space is moving so quickly if it takes my clients six months to procure a server on which to host the pilot to see whether this stuff is real. Um, and so in 2025, in three years, Marketing will have moved on 10 new names for intelligent automation and RPA and smart, whatever else. So that'll, that'll feel like we're, that'll make RPA feel like it's, it's ancient history, um, but it won't be. The technology will have evolved a bit. There'll be better APIs and intercouplings so that the, the citizen developer can lean on existing data models to, to, to evaluate things, you'll be able to sort of cobble together through visual means, better customer journey um, uh, capabilities that, you know, that then, then, then pull on like cobots and chatbots and data mining and whatever else. So that'll be better and a little easier. And enterprises will be probably very close to where they are now. There'll be those innovators who are truly 
shaking things up. There'll be some divisions that have just heard about this stuff for the first time that are trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, and there'll be some upstarts and new, new entrants that have had the privilege of, of structuring their reality without the baggage of their history that will challenge everything, whether it's a utility company or a bank or an insurance company or a healthcare company. Um, we'll see more and more um, new entrants that scare the pants off the large guys, and then the large guys will buy them and hope that some of that special sauce sort of infiltrates the, the parent company. And maybe it will, and maybe it won't, and, and at least the founders will have made a bunch of money with that sale. So that's mm -hmm. my point of view. I think, I think this is very interesting. In fact, uh, obviously it's gonna evolve from where it stands today. Uh, one of the interesting point that you mentioned about is the name would change because every time you see something uh, happening, there would be some consulting practice that would come up with a fascinating name. And totally, amazing. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and sell it as if it has never been done. But, never before. Uh, yeah, never First before. time on the planet. You're exactly right. <laughs> It'll sound so exciting, and yeah. uh, and but that's their job. That's what they get paid for. Absolutely. I just, I just don't know that it helps, right? Because I think, and and I I've done a lot of marketing in my day, so I you know I was trying that too. But um, sometimes we should uh, stop coming up with new names and start coming up with just some good case studies, some real good examples of applications, and and celebrate the heroes that are making it happen. Absolutely. Um, which again, which, you know, to, to sort of send it back in your camp, which is why I think um, impact sourcing is so interesting to me is because those are hero stories. Absolutely. Those are, you know, the prosperity that, that you enable um, and the people whose lives you change. That's a hell of a lot more exciting and energizing to me than some, some, you know, some voice recognition algorithm that's just one one hundredth of a percent more accurate at getting... Yeah accents so no absolutely i think uh, this is something which is anyways going to continue uh, we are seeing some very interesting pattern people becoming more and more aware about uh, you know what's beyond diversity and how how do we talk about impact creation in communities where you know there are lots and lots of things that are still not available you are talking about uh, people in prison uh, there's a model yes. in the us talk about people in prison and there you are leveraging them. In fact, uh, you know, there are a lot many things to do. It looks like it can be a better world tomorrow if we leverage the technology and leverage the, you know, untouched potential talent, which is there, which constitutes close to about 90% of untouched talent even today. Um, I think uh, we will be far better off. And the uh, Technologies and low-code, no-code platforms are going to make it much more easier for uh, you know these kind of people to be more inclusive and participate in the in the future of work. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Totally. So, Completely awesome. agree. Thank you so very much, Ian, for your time. Uh, it's, you. it's almost. Uh, I think it's more than an hour that we have been talking and chatting. Uh, people, thank you so much for joining us. In I'm sure that you have got the learning that you really wanted to have. Uh, we are going to share uh, some of the program links with you. Go have a look at them. See if you really want to upskill yourself. It's never too late, even if you are 50. So uh, I think totally. uh, that's it. Thank you so much, Ian. Closing comments and then we bid uh, thank you and goodbye to you. Perfect. Now, thank you so much. This is a great opportunity. I, I hope people got something out of our discussion. Um, if you're 50, you know processes a whole lot better than, than somebody who's just getting started. So there is there is no more valuable place to start, frankly. I, I think processes, knowledge and processes is the most solid foundation. And so low code, no code, giving people the tools to, to build the potential that they see possible. Yeah. is what's so exciting about this space. Um, so yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn if, if you aren't already. And uh, I'm going to continue exploring this space and, uh, and sharing what I learned. So hopefully that's, that's useful <laughs> to, to, to people. And, uh, and let's do this again. I really enjoyed Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Ian, for your time. I uh, really loved it. 
and i'm sure that you know we we continue to chat and and i'm continuing to follow the kind of uh, intriguing polls that you are putting up on linkedin i'm sure thank people will follow you and i'm sure that you are going to love them as well thank you so much have a good day ahead and looking forward to chat soon all right bye